Hello, BC Calculus students. This is Mr. Johnson, and I hope that you're doing well. This is section 1.4, and this is on graphing calculators. And unfortunately, due to um, the predicament we're in here with um, the iPad teaching, um, it is difficult for me to get a calculator on the screen. So I will do my best. I have a bunch of screenshots for this particular lesson, and I hope that's helpful. Um, certainly, as always, ask if you have questions and we will figure a way to work it out, okay? With the first two examples, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do a little bit of this by hand because I, I really want you to have um, the skills necessary and, and the intuition to figure out a screen or a window that makes a lot of sense for a particular graph. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest things that we can struggle with um, as math students is that we can take a look at a problem and we can get sort of caught in the world of looking at the calculator and saying, well, the calculator says it's not true or the calculator looks like this or the whatever. And we kind of forget about the intuition of the problem. And, and if we really thought about it, it wouldn't make any sense what we just got. Um, so I want you to make sure to think logically as you work through these problems. And I'm going to try to demonstrate that with um, these first two examples. And then I will also show you how misleading the calculator can be in a couple of other examples. So for this first example, we have this equation and we're looking at the window from negative two to two. Um, and so right away, we know that for X, uh, the, the window that makes obviously sense is negative two um, to two. Now the question is, uh, where is the graph gonna maybe be located on that window? You probably could use some intuition and get there, but I'm just gonna show you algebraically what might help. So we know that eight minus two X squared must be greater than or equal to zero. We, we know that because the square root function cannot operate on a negative value. So let's do this. Let's figure out what would make this particular, um, this particular expression equal to zero. So we have two, um, two X equal to eight, which means X, I'm sorry, two X squared equal to eight, means X squared is equal to four. And so we know that X is positive negative two. That might be kind of one of the reasons why the window is negative two to two. But anyway, if we were to look at this on a number line and we have negative two and two, we want to know on these three possible intervals. So we have some, you know, some large negative number all the way to negative two and in between negative two and two, and then from two on, we want to know what is the sign of each of those intervals. And it's very easy to test this because what we can do is we can plug in something. Let's say we want to plug in zero. And if we plug in zero for eight minus two X squared, we get eight, which is a positive number. So anything that is in between negative two and two is going to be positive. We could test another one if you want to plug in one you get eight minus two, which is six. And so anything on that particular interval is gonna be positive. Now let's go ahead and plug in, I don't know, like negative three. So we plug in negative three and square that, we get nine times two is 18. Eight minus that is certainly gonna be negative. So this will be a negative value. If we plug in positive three, we end up getting the same thing due to X being squared. So what we've confirmed is that if we're looking at the interval from negative two to two, then our Y values are going to be positive. Now, could we have gotten there without doing all of this work? I certainly hope so, because we know that if we're plugging in these values right here into our equation, the square root of that stuff we get can only be positive. So we, we should know that Y is going to be, um, you know, at a minimum zero. Okay, now what we're going to do is look at our y values, and if we uh, if we plug in x is zero here, so if we take the square root of eight minus two times zero squared, we get uh, the square root of eight or two root two, and so at the um, on the y-axis that is. We're going to have this y-intercept. I'm going to start to sketch this a little bit here. So let's say that this is my y-intercept roughly at 2 root 2. And we have, I don't know, let's say that this is negative 2. And that would put me over here at 2. And so what we have in terms of a graph is something that kind of looks parabolic here. 
and it kind of goes like that. So that's that's sort of a sketch of our graph. But the idea here is that we have our X window laid out or our X um, minimum maximum laid out. And then for Y, I would say that for Y, we're going to go from zero to two root two. And that's just sort of an algebraic approach to analyze the function itself. Okay, let's try the other, the, the uh, next one here. So we have um, a cubic function. I'm going to factor this. So we get uh, x times the quantity x squared minus 49. And that gives us x times the quantity x plus 7 times the quantity x minus 7. So what we have then is um, three x-intercepts, one at 0, one at, let's just say this is negative 7 and one at positive seven. Okay, now with a cubic function, with a positive leading coefficient, we know that the behavior, we should know the behavior of this graph looks something like this. So I'd say that for your x values, if you were to graph this on a calculator, it might make a lot of sense to maybe make this negative eight to eight or you know, negative nine to nine, something like that. You wanna make sure you include enough to see the graph. Now, in terms of the y values, this is kind of, you know, if you if you uh, haven't typed it in yet, you know, it's it's going to be a large number because if you think about it, um, you know, the, the values in between here, I mean, we're cubing it minus 49 times the x value. So I'd, I'd say as a ballpark, maybe we put it at about 150 or so um, just to see where, where it is. But again, that's where you take your calculator then and say, okay, I'm just going to try a relatively large number, maybe you try 100 first, or maybe you go up to 120 or 130 or something like that. But you just start playing with the numbers. Really, you want to be able to see the relative maximum, the relative minimum in order to analyze the graph a little more effectively. But the bottom line is you know where the x-intercepts are. You also know the behavior of the graph. And then from there, you can tweak your y um, minimum and maximum. OK, let's go on to the next page. Okay, so here I'm going to sort of cut to certain uh, pieces here just because I want to show you the calculator screens that I have. So first thing we're going to do is look at example three. In example three, um, you know, I would say, you know, maybe pause the video for a minute, grab your graphing calculator, and then you, what you want to do is you want to type in sine of the quantity 50x, okay? Now what I did, and I'm going to try to limit what I'm showing you here so that you don't, the fun is not spoiled yet. So what I did was I typed it into a standard window. Now, if you don't know anything about your calculator, um, that's really too bad because you've been in a lot of math, but I'll try to teach you. So on your calculator, you have the zoom window. If you do zoom six, that's a standard zoom, zoom window, which is negative 10 to 10 on both X and Y. Okay, so again, at any point here, I, I really, it's very important that you type this in while I'm talking through. So pause the video if you need a minute to type it in because I want you to experience it on your calculator yourself. And since I can't see you do that, um, make sure that you're, you're following along in that regard. All right, so if you have a, a standard window, you will uh, see this, this graph that definitely looks like some sort of sine cosine graph, um, but it's on this standard window. Okay, the next thing I want you to do is go to the zoom menu and in that menu, there's actually a trig option, which is kind of nice. And what it does is it sets up sort of a trig specific zoom option. And that zoom option um, is going to be the window that you see here on the right. Now, the interesting thing is that you can see the graph, you are zooming in to the graph, because again, the y, for instance, the y minimum is no longer negative 10, now it's negative four and so on. The x also shrunk down a little bit. And so you have this new window, okay? The next one that I did was I changed the x values to go from negative four to four, I think is what I did. Let's sh shift this down. I went from negative four to four with x, and I went from negative two to two for y. Now, I'm going to put this all on one screen. Those two graphs are extremely different looking, aren't they? It's almost uh, it's almost like we're looking at a different problem here. Now, what's the what's the whole point? Well, at the beginning of the section I mentioned that I want you to be really good at 
at looking at a problem and being able to analyze the technology you're using and whether or not it's misleading you, okay? And so a lot of people will go to, let's, let's say a graph like you see here, and they'll say, well, okay, that, that graph is fine, and maybe you're trying to find x-intercepts, or maybe you're trying to find a maximum, or I don't know what you're trying to find, but they just look at the graph and they go, yep, makes total sense, it's all good. But then all of a sudden, if you change your window, it shows you something terribly different. And so the question is, have you really thought about the problem much? So let's go back up to the problem for a second. The problem says that we're gonna graph y equals sine of the quantity 50x. Now, what does the 50 mean? Well, the 50 means that you are horizontally shrinking by a factor of one over 50. So if your period of sine is normally two pi, now what is the period of sine of 50x? Well, you're gonna take two pi and divide by 50. So you have a period of pi over 25. That is gonna be a lot of periods within what we would consider sort of a standard window. So if you, if you revert back to a window like this, this should be a huge warning sign. This doesn't make any sense at all because based on your window over here, you should have 50 different periods in this small little spot where you, it looks like you kind of just have one period there. Now you look at this part and you're going, okay, well, something's going on there. If you zoom in even further, it finally should make a little bit of sense. I made this window negative one to one and the Y is still at negative two to two, but all of a sudden we finally get a sense of the number of periods that this particular graph is gonna take. All right, so again, so the moral of the story here is that don't just rely solely on what the calculator is telling you and um, make sure to look at the problem and analyze what's reasonable here in terms of the number of periods for a trig function or maybe the y-intercept or the x-intercept of a particular function. Okay, uh, let's go to example four. So <clears throat> with example four, um, I just wanna quickly review with you how to find points of intersection. So what I've done on my calculator is I've um, typed in x for y1 and cosine of x for y2. Um, also, I completely forgot to say this in the last problem, but you need to make sure you're in radian mode always. Do not go to degree mode. So you want radian mode. If you had problems with the last um, example, you might have been in degree mode. Okay, so what I've done is I've graphed both uh, y equals x and y equals cosine of x, and you can see the two graphs here. To find the intersection, if you've forgotten over the summer, it is second and then the calculate menu, I will write this down for you. So we have second, that button, then the calculate menu, which is um, the, the trace button, but you're doing the second command. And when you do that, you're gonna choose option number five, which is intersection. Now what happens when you do this is that it asks for the first curve, which means the first graph, and the second graph. So if you have seven different graphs on your screen, it will ask you to identify the two different graphs that are being intersected, okay? Now on my screen, I only have two graphs, which means that I just select the only two that I have. The other thing it will do is it will ask you for a guess as to where the intersection is. The reason for that is that you may have eight intersections and it wants you to identify the one that you are intending to identify. So in this case, I have one intersection, so it's not really a big deal. But just keep in mind that if you have multiple ones, you'll need to give it a sort of an approximate guess so that it can identify, <clears throat> excuse me, the correct one. OK. At the bottom of the screen, you will find the correct intersection. Just as a quick review in calculus, we always round to three decimal places. And so if you were to answer this question, you would say that that is going to be our point of intersection in this case. Okay, last but not least, we have an AP problem. We get a little bit of calculus in here. Now the entire, and I'm sort of cutting, so this is example five. I just don't wanna, I don't wanna show you the screen first, okay? So hold on. So in example five, this is back in 2007 on the AB exam, it's a calculator problem. The scores were pretty poor on this particular problem. And I think I know why, but um, I wanna walk you through it first. So we have our, 
uh, region, the first and second quadrants, bounded by y equals 20 divided by the quantity 1 plus x squared, and then below by the horizontal line y equals 2. So what I did was I went to my calculator, because it's a calculator problem, so that's what I would do immediately, and typed it in. Now I used a standard window, which again, if you remember, is zoom 6. And the standard window goes from negative 10 to 10, both x and y. And this is what I got. Now, um, I didn't type in y equals 2, um, just because I, I, I'm not too concerned about that. I know exactly where that is. It's here. Um, and so my my guess here is that students said, you know what, um, there's, a, there's an issue because this graph is not bounded above. And my guess is that students got confused and they were trying to figure out how can I find the area of an unbounded region. Um, and believe it or not, in, in our class this year, BC Calculus, we'll actually explore this idea. But in AB Calculus, you don't get into this kind of concept. And so my thought is that students got confused, maybe skipped it or whatever. And that's why maybe the scores were so low. Now, what's the problem and what's the whole purpose of this particular section that we're studying? The purpose is that we need to use some common sense and not just rely on what we see on the calculator. Because what we see on the calculator is that it doesn't appear as though this graph has a, has a top boundary to it. It appears as though it just keeps on going forever. However, if you were to take a look at the equation right here, okay, we're wondering, is there a, is there a maximum for y? Well, the maximum for y is going to be when x is 0. And that means that y would be 20. Well, guess what? We don't have a window that is large enough. So all we need to do, and it seems so simple, but all we need to do is just change our window. If we change our window, it's very easy to see now that if we just put on our lower boundary of y equals 2, we have a bounded region right here. Okay? So again, it's just really important that we don't uh, rely solely on the calculator. We also rely on our minds as well. Okay, let's let's do the problem just because uh, it'll be kind of fun to do a little bit of calculus. So first off, we have y equals 20 divided by 1 plus x squared and y equals 2. Uh, that means that if we were to figure out the point of intersection, which yes, you can do on the calculator, but let's use algebra. We have, whoops, we have, uh, let's see, 1 plus x squared equal to 10. That means x squared is equal to 9. That means we have points of intersection of negative 3 and 3. Now, if you remember back to chapter 6 in AB Calculus, we did areas of bounded regions by integration. And we used the left boundary and the right boundary of the intersection. We calculated the area by doing the upper function subtracted by the lower function. And we simply just typed that into our calculator. A couple things to review on that. Number one, to do a definite integral, you press math 9. So math 9 to do a definite integral. Second thing is that if you're interested in doing a fraction on your calculator, some of you know this, I'm sure. <clears throat> Others of you, I'm guessing, don't. You can do a fraction on the new, you know, the 84, which most of you have. If you press alpha F1, which is alpha and the Y equals button, and press enter, you can actually get a fraction. And that means that you can type something like this in without messing up that denominator, if that makes some sense. So anyway, utilize that little trick if you want. But what I get here is um, is 37.962 if I round that third one. And that's going to be the area of that particular region. All right, that's it for section 1.4. Thank you.